Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 400 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron, and I'm so happy that you're here with me on episode 400, which feels enormous. It just feels so big. I cannot believe that we are at 400 episodes. And there are listeners here who have been around since the beginning. And I thank you. And there are listeners who are brand new hearing this for the first time today. And I thank you for spending your time here with me. It's truly an honor. I thought about doing something big and huge and amazing for episode 400, but you know what? No, mm -mm. I am taking some time off in December. So these are pre-recorded and these are going to be dripping out to you over the course of December. So I am doing something kind of special today. And we're going to talk about a, um, a feeling that might be a problem with your writing, but we're also going to just have a normal episode. Um, but it's not a normal episode because I'm talking to the amazing Kate Elliott. This is a super special conversation. I absolutely loved talking to Kate. We are going to talk about how to heal a tired writer's heart. If you are beaten down, if you are scared, if you are overwhelmed, if you don't like what you're writing, how do you heal that? We also talk about bullet journaling and about world building via what the character sees. And we also talk about um, how long a book is too long. This will make some of you feel a lot better. And uh, it's just a fantastic conversation. So please stick around for the interview that is shortly to follow. But in these pre-recorded episodes, I wanted to talk a little bit about this survey that I gave to writers on my writer email list, which you should be on. You can get on it by going to rachelherron.com slash write. And I asked a series of questions and I wanted to know the feelings that kept writers from the page. And I'm going to talk about four of the most frequently said answers on that response form. Um, side note, I did a really cool thing. I think I mentioned this uh, in an earlier episode, but there were a lot of people who responded to that. And there were a lot of questions on that form. And a bunch of the questions were like, name the top three X, your top three fears, your top three joys, or your top three um, difficulties. And to look at all of those responses one by one, which I did, was great, but also a little bit overwhelming because I kept thinking like, ooh, has this been said? How was this said by somebody else? So I actually asked AI to help me with this. I used Claude 2 for this. Um, I had done a little bit of it with chat GPT, but it kind of got confused by all of the responses. Uh, Claude 2 handled it a lot better. And this is a perfect use case for a large language model AI because I basically fed the answers in, of course, all anonymized, no names, et cetera. And then I would ask, what are the top 15 feelings that keep writers from the page. And it would look at the hundreds of answers and distill them. And it could tell that this person had said something very similar to this person. And so it would combine them into a phrase that held all of it. And I just found it so, so, so useful. So I will tell you the overview, um, the ones I'm going to go over real quickly, just real quickly on the show in our little uh, intro here before we get to the guests. Um, Exhaustion slash low energy. That's what we're going to talk about today. That's a really common feeling that keeps people from the page. Distraction or lack of focus. That'll be next week. Perfectionism or self-criticism. That'll be the week after that. And lack of confidence. That'll be the last week before I come back. So today let's talk about just really quickly about this feeling of exhaustion that keeps us from the page. I know that it has kept me from the page a million times. Writing takes mental focus and effort, right? And that mental focus, that energy that it takes, when we are drained or tired or overwhelmed, we just don't have the energy to bring to the page. So how do we combat that? It is not easy. It is not easy. You are living an actual real life with real problems and real things to do. Um, you have a lot of obligations. And for most of you listening, most of your time is earmarked for doing something which probably takes some kind of mental focus. There are very few times when we are, you know, our biggest job for the day is lying in a spa tub and watching the stars. That takes, that's a low, that's a low effort kind of thing to do. Um, most of our time is not spent that way. 
So we're talking about finding the mental focus, finding the energy on those days or during those times when we are low energy, when we are exhausted. And this is something I talk, talked about in my most recent writer's email that I sent last week. I hope you got it. It was about the five minute trick. And we've talked about this before, but for me, when I am at that exhaustion, like all systems critical, but I still want to keep writing phase, I have to give myself a minimum viable effort. And I mean, minimum, I am not actually trying to make myself get a lot done. I am trying to make myself get a very, very, very minimal, the most minimal amount of work done that I can possibly still feel proud of. For me, that is five minutes. Other people choose 10 minutes. I have known multiple writers who have had great success by setting it at one minute. For me, one minute, I could I could barely get my brain in gear in one minute, but five minutes, if I tell myself that for the next four days, say, for the next month, I'm going to be trying to get five minutes at a time in my document, on my project. I want to cross off those days where I get five minutes done. But here's the thing. It cannot be a trick. This cannot be a trick. Getting those five minutes must be the success that you hit. It's a true thing. If you are done with the five minutes, you've barely opened your manuscript, you have looked at the last few lines that you wrote, you thought for a little bit and your timer, because you should use a timer, super, super helpful. Your timer goes off saying that your five minutes is up. It must be true that you are satisfied and proud of doing five minutes that day. If you want to continue, sure, fine, you may. But a lot of times when I am exhausted, when I am fighting no energy, low energy, zero energy. The five minutes is all I can do. And I have to celebrate what in whatever way that looks like. For me, it's normally coloring in a box in my bullet journal or putting a check mark or giving myself a gold star. It could be um, 30 minutes of reading if you do five minutes of work. I mean, that just sounds like the ideal ratio to me, honestly. It has to be true. It has to be real. And also we have to remember that exhaustion is real. Zero energy, zero spoons is real. And there are some days when you can't write. There might be many days, depending on where you are in your life, that you cannot write. However, there is a difference between zero spoons, true exhaustion when the brain will not work, and when you're very tired and your brain doesn't want to work. My body and mind, your body and mind, know the difference. I can almost gauge it. And this may, I'm sure this is different for everybody, but I, because I tend to be a guilt and shame kind of feeling person, uh, not the thing I love best about myself, but it is there. Uh, I can almost gauge it on the guilt I feel when I think about working. If I feel guilty when I am not doing those five minutes, it's probably because I could, I'm not saying that I'm going to do good work and I'm not saying I'm going to do long work, but I could do some work. The days where I truly have zero spoons, for health reasons or mental health reasons, I am quicker to say, oh yeah, you can't do that today. That's okay. You don't, you don't have it today. You can't do this today. And I give myself that break. Um, that is something I've been working on doing, but there is a difference in my gut when I think about, is it that I don't want to because I'm so tired or because I can't. So asking yourself that question really gently can be so, so helpful. Another thing, and I know everybody hates this and Becca Simon always talks about this. Everybody hates this, but doing those five minutes as early in the day as possible can be the best thing you can do for yourself as a writer. Even if it is just getting up five minutes earlier than you have to and writing between feeding the cats and feeding the kids. Lying and saying you're going to the bath. Well, maybe you do go to the bathroom, take your phone in the bathroom and write for five minutes. Um, find that five minutes or whatever your minimum viable effort, whatever you decide that is. Um, please don't decide that it's 30 minutes when you are fighting chronic fatigue, chronic exhaustion, chronic low energy. If you set it, if you set your minimum viable effort for 30 minutes and then don't hit it, it'll feel terrible, but we can do one minute. We can do five minutes again, not good work, but some work. And that keeps us moving forward toward our goal. And then one day, we go, oh, I'd like to do another minute today. That feels great. Or, oh, and I kind of know where the scene is going now because I've thought about it for the last three days. 
and I know what to do and I want to do it. And then we follow, we can follow that energy, but we do not make ourselves do more. Whatever your minimal viable effort is for the day or for the week, maybe it's five minutes, five times a week, maybe it's three minutes, seven days a week, whatever that is. Take the joy, take the wins, take the rewards that you give yourself from hitting that. Um, and also honor when it's truly a time and space in your life when you cannot because you do not have it in you. That happens. That is normal. That's part of the writer's life. Okay. So um, that said, let's jump into the interview with the amazing Kate. I'm going to bookend this with a little um, message from one of my students named Kate too. It's a Kate day. All right. Uh, here is Kate Elliott, who lives in Hawaii. USA. And in addition to the Crossroads series and the Crown of Stars series, she is the co-author of The Golden Key. Please enjoy this incredible episode and happy writing to you, my friends. We'll talk soon. Well, I am so pleased to welcome you to the show today. Will you please share your name and pronouns with us? My name is Kate Elliott. She, her. Thank you. We were just chatting uh, right before we started about how we love talking about process and we love talking to writers. I also love talking to people on islands. I happened to sneak a peek at your, you live on Hawaii in on Oahu, um, and I sneaked a peek at your Wikipedia. You are a Mills alum, I believe. Is that right? I am. Yeah, are me you? too. I got my <gasps> MFA there in the 90s. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Isn't that cool? Yeah. I was, my wife and I lived in Oakland for a very long time before we chose to move here, which is where my mother is from. But yeah, wow! I'm an Oakland girl. Mills, Mills. Yeah, actually, I, I'm a bent twig. If you know what that means, my sister went I there too. I do know what that means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm. I was. Um, I, I grew up in rural Oregon, and when I applied to college, I wanted to go somewhere that wasn't rural Oregon. So I went to Oakland, and boy, was it different for a rural Oregon girl. So <laughs> entirely yeah. different. Oh, that's very yeah. cool. Well, yeah. I'm glad to be speaking to you today, and you are. A writer who writes a lot of books under, I believe, two pen names. Is that right? Just one. Kate just Elliot. the one. Just Kate Elliott. Yeah. And how do you get it done? How do you get the work done? <laughs> um, I treat it as a job. So mm. I love to write. And I've all, I've written since I was a teenager. Uh, writing has always been something I've wanted to do. And I went through the same things probably most beginning writers do or aspiring writers do, which is, you know, I wrote and then I wrote a novel and it was no good. And then I wrote another novel and it wasn't any good either. And <laughs> so, you know, eventually I got my first sale. That was so exciting. Um, I am one of those people who happen to write my career started right as I was having children I have three children who are now adults and so I was always writing books and raising babies uh and one one of the things I discovered early on which is that if I wanted to do it as the equivalent of a full-time job you know so there's really kind of you're mm -hmm. kind of juggling two full-time jobs there yeah. um was that I had to treat it as a job and I had to be able to treat it as a job without losing what I loved about it. So if you just treat it as a mechanistic thing, then pretty soon it just gets to be, well, I'm going to write this thing so that whatever. So I wanted to, I, I probably have made some bad career decisions in my life by saying, I just want to write this thing I want to write, even though maybe an editor's hinting they would like this other thing that they think might be more commercial. And I'm always so kind of, pig-headed that I'm like no I'm going to write this thing I want to write so I have managed to write for over I've been publishing for over 30 years it's a long time mm -hmm. I still love to write publishing industry is really rough um, and is exhausting far more exhausting than writing but I've managed to do it because I've treated it in that other sense as a job you know if if I have to work five days I, I work five days a week I don't like just say, well, I feel like it today, but I don't feel like it. You know, I, if I say I don't feel like it today, it's like, well, then write 500 words. Mm -hmm. You know, if if it's Saturday, take the weekend off. You know, don't if it's a deadline, then maybe you can work through to get it done if you've got a short thing. But treat it as a job. Give yourself time off. Treat it seriously. Take yourself seriously. And then especially as a parent. Give yourself Give yourself time when you hit those times when you can't write because there's some kind of a, an emergency 
because sometimes that happens and then don't mm -hmm. beat yourself up about it and just say, I'm going to get back to it, you know, the instant I can. So that's, that's how I have treated my career. How do you, I love all of that. You're speaking my language. Um, I was just talking to a student who has had many traditional books published and she's kind of been in a slump for a while and she's got this book that she knows is good and she must finish but she has lost that spark she has treated it like a job for so long we've been discussing this together um how do you keep the joy of it how do you so, personally do that so treating it when I say treating it like a job I mean things like um Back in the day, my mother would sometimes call me in the middle of the day and I would say, mom, I can't talk to you right now. And she'd go, well, why not? And I'd say, because I'd, I'd say, would you call? So um, I'm the youngest of four kids. I'd say, would you call my, my, my eldest sister, who's a professor? I said, would you call her in the middle of when she's teaching and, <laughs> and think she was going to talk to you? Yeah. And there was a pause and I could tell that it was sinking in. And then she kind of laughed and said, well, I would want to, <laughs> but she stopped calling me in the middle of the day. So yeah. I think when I, when I say, think of it as a job, I mean, the, the taking it seriously part, not like that, that, that two th that thing is that I have to be consistent as consistent as I can. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean I have to be rigid about it. But also that I need to take myself seriously and not say, oh, I'm just a writer and, and I write on the side, but I don't write on the side. This is my career. So that's what I mean, not, not in the sense, and, and I understand what she's saying because um, it can be hard. It can be hard. I was just talking with a friend of mine, another multi, you know, a person who's been publishing for quite a while, actually a pretty, in this case, a pretty big name. I'm not going to mention who she is, but people would have heard of her. But we were kind of, kind of laughing kind of in that way when you're kind of gritting your teeth and laughing. And it's like, you know, and she's like, I'm never going to, she said, I, I really don't. She said, I have one book left on my contract and I just, I want to write it. And then I want to, I don't want to write on two contract again, where you sign the contract and then you have to write the book mm -hmm. because that pressure is just starting to get too much. Um, I had a situation in, I can't even remember what year it is anymore because of the pandemic. In 2022, I had a situation where I had a, a very unpleasant publishing thing happen to me quite, I, I mean, I've had a lot of ups and downs in publishing. Um, and this was possibly the most debilitating thing that had ever happened to me. And I went for like a month or two where I thought maybe I should just stop writing because I was so debilitated by something that had happened to me in the publishing industry. And I was supposed to be working on a book under contract that the publisher wanted like right away so they could bring it out close to the the you know so the the books the books two and three of a trilogy could come out mm -hmm. together and every time I looked at that third book I would flinch mm -hmm. and it's a book that I knew the plot I was excited I loved the characters I'm excited about the project but every time I would look at it I would flinch and so I chose to grab a hold of a thread you know I'm always like juggling I'm always like working on other things at the same time things are percolating like kind of on the back burner right there might be simmering or I might have just put one ingredient into a pan or there might be a little stew that's gonna on the slow cooker not really ready yet and I thought you know what I'm just gonna work on this other thing for a little while just to kind of get out of that and I sat down and just it was like a grand piano dropped into my head and I wrote a very long, I wrote a duology in five months. Oh my goodness. It just poured out of me. And I don't usually, I usually need more time to percolate something before yeah. it comes. I just wrote that draft. And when I, every time I would, at, at first I would think to myself, you, you need to pause here and go back to the thing that's under contract. But then I stopped saying that to myself because I said, this is it. This is how you're healing yourself. Uh, yeah. You're healing that place you were, that despair you were in by writing something for no reason. 
except that I wanted to write it. Now, is it going to, can I use bad language here? Yes, you may. Yeah. Is it going to fuck up my schedule for the other book? Yes, but it's going to help me. And that's what I have to think about longer term. So that's, so when I say that I think of it as a job, but I still hold on to the joy, I, I found that way to remind myself that I still love to write. I absolutely love that. that, Yeah. So what happened when you went back to the, to the third book? Well, I'm still working my way into that. I have about, it's going to be a really long and complicated book. So I have maybe a fifth of it written and, and I'm in the process of trying to write a really complex outline because I can't, it has to all be done in one book. There's probably enough material for three books. Well, I know there's enough material for three books. There's probably enough material for five books. So I have to compress. Um, so I am still struggling with that book a little, but the the duology I wrote did sell. Um, and I, um, I'm just waiting for editorial notes. So it's going to end up coming out before the other one. Wow. Yeah. So, and you knew that you needed that healing. You, that I was the way to I do needed, it. Yeah. So if people feel like they need healing and a lot of times, in my opinion, it's the industry that is most that harms us most just the way the industry is set up um that's most exhausting and that you know tells us i don't know it's just it's rough Mm -hmm. um find a way whatever way works for you and it might be writing something else it might be doing something else you know oh i'm gonna try art or i'm gonna i I don't know it's going to be different for everybody yeah but i don't know i think that we as creative people that's where we find our joy. There's so much deep and really profound wonder and joy in the act of creation, however it works. And it doesn't have to be in writing. It can be in other things. And when I think when people feel broken, I hope they can find a thread that leads them back to a place where they can find that joy. Cause that I think is why most people started. I love that. Thank you so much. Speaking of that joy, what is your biggest joy when it comes to writing? You know, I love revising, which is that thing. I used to love first drafting, but now I find it stressful because the internal editor is sitting right there over my shoulder looking, that's no good. That's not working. Mm -hmm. So my joy actually comes in two places. So when I finally have the first, the first draft done, then, and I can go back in and fix it. I love that. When I begin to say, oh, this scene, I just need to rearrange this, cut this bit. And now it works the way I wanted it to. Or now I understand what my theme is, right? And what, what I was trying to say, even though maybe I didn't realize it while I was writing the first draft, you know, now I can go refigure everything to make it work for that. I love that. And then one thing that happened when I wrote that book, with that, that was not under contract and that was delaying something that was under contract. I, it had been so long. It, there are moments in first drafting where the flow just hits you. And it just, it just the, the words and the scenes and the characters and the interaction, just, it's just, they pour out of you. And that's an incredible sensation mm. I always felt. So I had, I found that again, I, I would get it in bits and pieces, you know, oh, this chapter wrote really fast, you know, and then the next chapter was like slogging through mud with molasses coated over your, all over your body. (laughs) Right. Just like, you know, and thorny branches slashing you and terrible. Right. But the whole book was like that. And so I thought, okay, it's still there. That's so that's the other, the other side of it. And then I will admit that as a writer, I do get joy when I run into readers who say things about my books that make me feel that they got it, Mm. like they got what I was trying to do. And then sometimes, and this is maybe not joyful as much as almost humbling, when you realize that your writing helped someone. Literally the best. And when it happens, I like to really, because it doesn't happen that often for me, but I like to take it in and spend time with it and really like kind of 
hug it and think about it and revel in it because that that is so important. What is your biggest challenge when it comes to writing? It's getting started <laughs> every day, every day. It's Talk like, to me more well, about that. How do you get yourself to the page, to the, oh, to the desk? Um, sometimes I just remind my, sometimes I just stop and say, what are you doing? You're, you're procrastinating. And I do that a lot these days. Um, so I do a couple of things. I, I have my bullet journal, which I don't use super well in that I don't decorate. I just want all possible bullet journal used. If, if you like the idea of a bullet journal and I, I like it for the index, um, mostly yeah. you don't have to decorate it. You don't have to be artistic. You can just use it as a place to take notes and organize things. That's what I do. So yeah. Yeah. I, I know people who are the most artistic. I love looking at them, but I have done that for one or two weeks a few years ago and they were beautiful <laughs> and they took me an hour or two. Why am oh, I going to spend so time good. doing that? Yeah. No, it's a list. It's a, but it, but it is it's, bullet. It isn't, it yeah. is a bullet journal. Yeah. yeah. It's like okay, my brain. On. I think of it as like why I write down my brain and my bullet yes. journal. So sometimes I'll say just like, you know, short story, 500 words. So yeah. if I, if I can make that 500 words, then I can be like, okay, you delayed for three hours, but you wrote your 500 words. So I don't have to beat myself up because the beating up is what makes it even harder to start the next day. Right. Yes. And then if I go longer, it's like, yeah, I went longer. And then maybe then I'll move it up to a thousand and then I'll, you know, so I try to specify my goals without making them too big. And then I do find um, sometimes trigger things helpful. So like I, I'll have a playlist say on um, my iTunes or on YouTube and sometimes I'll forget and I'll like dither around for two hours and then I'll say, wait, let me just go start my playlist. And then that song will be a trigger for me. Oh, I got to start writing. So that yes. might not work for everybody, but sometimes it's just like, put your pencil in this one place. You put your pencil in the place, you start working. So or whatever, like little routines. Um, that's what I do. Or I remind myself that it's okay, that it doesn't matter that the first draft this is always first drafting. I can dive right into revision without me issue. too. I can yeah. dive in and stay in in revision. Whereas two hours yeah. of first drafting just makes me want to die. I also have a, a trigger thing that I was just, I just thought of is that I have a particular pair of headphones that I wear when I'm working and I tend to turn on music or white noise, you know, music without words. But a lot of times I will forget like the, 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 yeah they will go in and then I'm just writing and I don't actually need the noise. I needed the feeling and the feeling told me, Oh, I'm writing now. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's yeah. I think just those little things, because we can, we are creatures, right? Where yeah. humans are pattern making creatures. And so the procrastination becomes a pattern. Yes. I sit down in my desk, but you know, what could I be doing? Could be doing something else. What if I, you know, whatever. So just something, that one thing, whatever it might be. I like the headphone thing. Maybe I should do that because I like yeah. my headphones. I, oh my gosh, I have, I have like four headphones I can see on my desk right now. I'm so specific <laughs> and yeah, we won't even go there. Um, oh, can no, you, Cause no, we could talk about so it. interesting. <laughs> Which headphone for, you could have a different headphone for each project. Right? These are for, these are for writing and revision. This is for teaching. These are for the podcast. I have one next to the bed that are soft. I have sensory issues. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. But that's the thing is, you know, when people, it, it's, that's, it's that, that tendency, at least in American school, that one size fits all. And it's a very specific, narrow way you're supposed to learn. But the thing is, is that figure out what works. Yes. I think it's great that you have at least four different kinds of headphones, you know, I, how fantastic. <laughs> That's awesome. Will you share a quick craft tip of any sort with us? A quick craft tip. Okay. This is the one I always use. So okay. I apologize. I'm like super um, into world building, uh, maybe too much into world building. I could like world build till the cows come home and I could pile in every single detail that you would ever wow. want and make it. But I just love world building. And when for, and not everybody wants that. Um, in a book, not everybody wants that in their world. But the one, the one craft tip I would say about world building that I have found really useful is to, I guess the how would I say it? Try to understand the relationship 
between your character and the world they're in, how they relate to the world, how they fit into the world. And also try to think of that world you're building in terms of how they see it and not how you see it. Oh, yes. I think I talk about, I think about that a lot when I'm building characters and we don't want it. We don't always want to describe what the character looks like brown hair, blue eyes, you know, we want to describe how it feels to our main character to view that person and what they yeah. notice. So it's the yes. same. It's exactly the same yeah. thing with world building. That is, that is so smart. What do they particularly see and notice that Rachel Heron wouldn't necessarily notice? And, and, and actually you bring up an excellent point. This, this idea, one way to do it is through details. So they walk into a room, the character has to walk into a room. Now, if I walk into a room being me, I'm going to notice certain things. And as a writer, I might write about the things that I would notice, mm -hmm. but then I can do that if I need to, to, to mm -hmm. get a sense of the room. But then I need to step back and say, what is this person going to notice? So I wrote mm -hmm. one of my um, I wrote the Spirit Walker trilogy, which starts with cold magic, has a character in it who sews. Well, I don't sew. Um, I mean, I can I can put on a button, right? I can put a button back on base. It won't look good, but I can put it back on. Um, and But I had to think about what would she notice in the world? She would notice not just people's clothing in that fashionable sense, but how it was made. Mm. and what it was you know was it from new cloth or was it repurposed or what function did it have and how well was it sewed and, and how and, well were and, they taking care of it so, yeah and, which would, and then oh that's good yeah and then in the second book in particular she comes to an a play a new place where she's an outsider but she creates bonds by doing things like sewing little she's staying at a, a boarding house in kind of the equivalent of alt history caribbean mm -hmm. um by sewing little vests for the kids right so she makes herself useful through sewing to the that and, and so that's yeah as opposed to the the things that i might have noticed or i might have put in so i had to yeah. and then that in itself is a form of deep world building yeah that. yeah so yeah think but about details the details your character would notice not just facts not just how many chairs and tables are in the yeah. tavern but what the character sees oh that yeah. is genius and so good may i ask you what is the kindest thing anyone's ever done for you in your writing career um, I love this question. Uh, I, I don't know that there's one kindest thing. So I will say a kind thing that was done for me is that many years ago, before I was published, when I was still querying to agents, um, an agent who was interested in the work I had sent her, sent it to one of her writers who had no reason, who didn't know me, um, and it, this, this is Judith Tarr, who um, is, has had a long career in a, as a fantasy uh, writer. And she read like the first couple chapters and did this. Actually, it was a rather brutal critique, but it was a respectfully brutal critique. It was like, yeah. okay, I think there's promise here. So I'm going to tell you what I really think, which wow. to me is the best kind of critique to get at that at that stage, because then either you find out that you can deal with it, because if you can't, then you might just retreat, you know, um, and maybe that's for the best for Ben. But but um, she didn't have to spend that time, but she did. And I've always been I just thought that was a very kind thing for her to do. Did you ever speak to her about it later in your career when were you at a conference yeah, I got together? To know, and, I got oh. to know her later. Yeah. Yeah. So I felt very fortunate. I was always, always, and I made, I was absolutely clear to her when I met her, how, how grateful I was for that. Yeah. Nothing better than that. What is the kindest thing you've done for yourself as a writer? Hmm. That one's tougher. Um, I think the kindest thing I've done for myself is something I mentioned earlier, which is I have allowed myself even when it maybe wasn't the smartest idea to write what I wanted. Yeah. 
uh, not not feel like I had to force something that I could have done. And it was just like, yeah, but I like that shiny one over there. And so I'm going to, you know, someone hinting that's happened to me. Someone had hinted, don't you, whatever. And it was like, no, I want to do this shiny, this thing that I want to do. <laughs> um, and maybe that it's probably maybe in some ways it has hurt my career, but I think artistically for me that I feel that I'm still writing the stories I want to write. I, I recently, well, last year, um, I <laughs> did that. I followed my, my shiny sparkly object and wrote a book on spec not contracted, didn't tell my agent about it, just wrote it because I wanted to write something that I loved. And then she, she sold it. And, um, that will be my sixth genre. So I am like, like six, six, jo six genre. genres, not even like within a, and I definitely could have done more for my career financially if I never stuck to one, but I've, I've, I've done the same thing because I want to stay in the joy and the flow and the love. I've only yeah. had to force really forced two books and they, and one, I still hate the other one turned out fine, but that was, what a miserable feeling. It's just, yeah. Tell me your hard. six genres. I'm so fascinated by this. They are memoir, um, upmarket book club, women's fiction, whatever we want to call that, uh, nonfiction about writing, um, thriller romance. What is the other one? Oh, I'm entering paranormal, uh, Pa oh, uh, magical realism <laughs> good for you I mean I'm just such a I'm such good. a deep genre writer I'm just such a skiffy writer science fiction fantasy writer I feel like I'm stuck here but I'm not stuck here I mean it's a huge field and I love yeah. it um but good for you I think that's fantastic I truly I like that you say that though truly everything I write is under the problematic umbrella of women's fiction even including my memoir like that is that I always write yeah. women's relationships with themselves as they develop, including myself and including the writers that I write to when I'm writing about writing. So yeah. I could, yeah. I could put myself under that umbrella, but I'm the same way as a reader. Like my reading makes absolutely no sense. I've been reading a lot of science fiction lately and I just keep thinking, mm. no, no, you may not, you may not en enter that realm. Yes. Oh, wait, wait, not. Rachel, Rachel, you may. <laughs> You may enter no, that realm. No, I'm like no, the big, I'm the world's best enabler. <laughs> you may. So I'll be waiting. Amazing. Speaking of many books, what is the best book that you've recently read and why did you love it? Um, oh, I, I, I'm so bad about best books. So good books <laughs> that I have read recently. Um, so I went on a trip recently, uh, like a long considered trip that I've always wanted to go to Central Asia. Uh, mm -hmm. for various reasons, which I won't go into, because uh, I could go on for too long about that. But anyway, I was able to go for a, a like a three and a half week trip to, trip to Central Asia. And, you know, I don't sleep well on trips. So I, I am always juggling that thing of saying, I'm going to get through this without worrying that I don't sleep well, because I don't want becoming anxious about sleep mm -hmm. to ruin the trip for me. So it'll be like, you'll get up in the morning, got five and a half hours of sleep. Okay, that's fine. This is what so we have. I, yep. I, yeah, so I began, um, but late in the trip, it kind of got bad. And mm -hmm. I began reading a book I had that I was had to give to somebody at the, for reasons I won't explain. Um, and it was a kind of a literary, you know, it was a women's fiction novel. And I began reading it and I just found it. So there's nothing wrong with the book. It was well written, but it was it was so bleak and grim that it began mm. to stress me out. Oh, no. So I went back to my Kindle and I found a novel by Rika Aoki. So I had done an event with her last year. Mm. Um, and for that event, I read her debut science fiction novel, which is called A Light from Uncommon Stars, which oh. is set in the, have you read it? I read it. I love it. Isn't it lovely? It's yeah, and she's gorgeous. lovely. So we had, I had never met her before. I hadn't read the book before, but I read it to do the event. We had a great event. Yeah. So she has her first novel is called Hemele Ahilo, which means a Hilo song. And it's set on the big island. And I just had it on my Kindle because I bought it, you know, whatever, but I hadn't. So I'm like, oh, I can't deal with this anymore. Let me, oh, here's something. And she is a compassionate writer 
who deals with things that are hard, but her compassion for humanity is so strong that there's a sense of being soothed. Mm -hmm. Even when bad things may be happening, there's a sense of like that you're being held by arms that are going to hold you, right? That'll... And so I started, re and so it got me through the last week of the trip because if it was 3 a.m. and I woke up, and I, instead of fretting, oh no, I'm not gonna get any more sleep tonight. I would just open it to there or on the long flight back. I would just, and it was just so lovely. It's set, it's a story set on the big island. It's a multiple cast. It's very, I mean, if you wanna know what Hawaii is like, it's a great example of what Hawaii is actually like rather than Hawaii 5 which is not an <laughs> example of what Hawaii is like. Um, but it was just, it was just, it's just, a, it has a little fantastical element that I want to say any more than that. Yeah, no, because I'm going to, I'm going to grab it. It's wonderful. Yeah. And it was just, it was, it just, it was, it was the, the arm around me that I needed at that time. So that I can't say anything better gorgeous. than that about a book. I right? will immediately go put that on my TBR list. I've been kind of obsessed with this warm, comforting science fiction, the side, that side of science fiction. And uh, yeah. Be Becky Chambers, of course, comes to mind. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so, oh, yeah. thank you. Thank you for that. Let's talk about your writing now. Will you please tell us about your most recent release? Boy, my most recent stuff. So I can't, I have uh, this thing that I wrote, which I can't announce yet because it hasn't been announced yet. And it's, unfortunately, it's not coming out till 2025. It is a fantasy with a strong romantic element, but I would mm -hmm. not quite call it romanticy, but maybe, I don't know, mm -hmm. it skirts the line. I'm mm -hmm. a little too much of a world builder political person, <laughs> but but I'm happy to call it romanticy, whatever. Anyway, but I can't talk about that. Pretend I didn't say anything about that. It will be announced, I don't know, sometime in the next few months, presumably. Yeah. Um, so the, the last two things that have come out for me both came out this year in, in January, a novella called The Keeper's Six, which is a, uh, it's not really paranormal, but it's like a portal story. It starts on Oahu, um, but it has, there's ways to go into other, other worlds. Uh, it's, and um, it's the story of a woman and a, a much older woman whose adult son is kidnapped, which isn't really a spoiler because it happens on page one where she finds out about it on page one. And then she has to get the old gang back together to, to go rescue him. So it's that kind of story. Oh, um, and it's short. It's like a lot of my books are really long yeah. um, and very intensely world built. So that's just kind of like my, my brand, I guess, um, to use that terrible capitalistic phrase. <laughs> but, um, this is a nice, this one and Servant Mage, which is the novella that came out last year, which is an unrelated fantasy that's also a short uh, about a young woman and some of the, I don't want to go into that. Anyway, it's, it's a great short novella. Those are both great ways that to introduce kind of like my vibe to people mm -hmm. without having to read uh, something, the length of my book um, that came out in April, which is called Furious Heaven, which is book two of this space opera. And it is really long. I mean, it's really long. It's got a cast of hundreds. It's got multi-threaded things. It's the, the space opera's premise is gender swapped Alexander the Great in space. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. So the first one is called Unconquerable Sun. Furious Heaven just came out. They're, um, they're fast paced. They're complicated. They're long. I had so much fun world building them. And, and the third book of this, which is going to be even more complicated, is the one that I'm wrestling with right now. So it's like the big project I'm taking on next. So that's what's recent for me. When you say long, how many words would you guess that? Um, say I wouldn't is? guess. I would tell you Furious you Heaven is 300,000 words. Oh, yes. Just say it. God. I know. I was I, prepped for like 180. I was not prepped for 300. Oh, 180. <laughs> so, okay. Unconquerable Sun is like 165. And I was relieved that it was that short. Um, I wrote a, 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 a trilogy, a young adult trilogy called Court of Fives. Um, and, you know, 
with two great editors. And let me tell you, those books are all 100,000 words, which for me is nothing. But when I'm finished Furious Heaven and I revive Furious Heaven, I'm looking at it, just shaking my head at myself because I've done this before. This isn't the this, is, this isn't my first rodeo with a 300,000 word book. And I'm not Brandon Sanderson to be bringing in heaps of money to them to, regardless of the number of pages and the right. tiny font, right? But I look at this and I thought, you know, if this were, if I was smart, this would be three books, but it isn't. It has to be one book because of the nature yeah. of the story. So, yeah. oh, well, so you talk about, these are, I'm talking about bad decisions, bad <laughs> career decisions, <laughs> But artistic decisions <laughs> that I couldn't, that I wouldn't change. Yeah. And so and for I, people listening, 300,000 words is a lot, probably too many for most people's books, unless you are deeply in space opera and there are reasons. Um, so <laughs> you have to have a, you have to, I have the capacity for whatever reason. A, a friend of mine jokes that my natural length is the trilogy, not the short story, not the novel, <laughs> but the trilogy. And it, probably is because my, for whatever reason, and I don't say this as something that's good or bad, it just is, my brain likes to function with these very complicated, I don't know, I'm going to say symphonies with a whole bunch of instruments and they're mm. weaving in and out of each other. Mm -hmm. And I just, I've always written like that. And I don't know, I don't even know why, but that's just so writing a young adult trilogy, which is the same length as that one book <laughs> with which is, it's kind of like everything I'm doing, only everything had to be stripped down. And in fact, the editor would say, I just loved this three page discussion of the complicated dynastic elements of this family and how important they are to the plot. Now, can you bring it all down to one sentence? <laughs> That's a good and editor. You know, That's... She, she was great. And if I had been writing it as an adult novel, I would have, I might not have kept it at three pages, but I would have, it, there would have been more of it, yeah. but, but I learned so much working with her and that I wrote that before the space opera. And I got to tell you, it taught me, it helped me write the space opera. So those 3000 words, 300,000 words, 3000 words, I don't know, what am I saying? Those 300,000 words, they are packed. They're, There's they're not long down, stretches right. of nothing happening. They are right. packed with incident. They are packed with emotional mm. interactions. They are packed with, well, battles um, and, and politics and intrigue and backstabbing and terrible things and good things, right? terrible crushes and good, you know, yeah. good relationships, everything. Um, and I was able to do it. I, it is really long. Someone, I, I, okay, I'm going to tell you one of the funniest reviews I have seen was someone who had read Unconquerable Sun, which is 165,000 words. And then they said, there was something, they said, I liked Furious Heaven a lot, but there must be something wrong with the pacing because it's, it's only it's the, the the book page numbers are the same because you know they did the the right. smaller font right to they compress the pages so it's a little for old eyes like mine it's not so great to mm -hmm. to read but but they're paper saving that's what they do I understand yep, that is what they do um, that is what they do they said so this person said but I don't know the books are the same length but this one just took me a lot longer to read. <laughs> because it was double the length because it was double the length <laughs> so i thought that's pretty good that means it was paced well because they didn't yes they didn't feel it was right. so much longer oh that, that is really awesome i yeah. i know we're like we're we're a little bit over time here but i must ask oh sorry you, you, forgot. No, this you is forgot perfect. that I'm you're in, talking to I'm me in, i'm in you know, 300,000 words sorry is, <laughs> <laughs> I, my students always know when i say are you an overwriter or an underwriter i think most writers go i know which one i am like immediately they don't have to waffle uh, i'm an overwriter I'm an, over, overwriter I'm an overwriter forever. you already know that i'm an overwriter yeah <laughs> but I must my whole ask, thing how? yeah in review <laughs> I had a book. Okay. So the third book of the Crossroads trilogy, which is a fantasy, Trader's Gate, I wrote the first draft because I knew exactly what had to happen. The first draft was 350,000 words. I wrote Holy. it in a year, in a year. Bam. I was just like flat out. So I turn it in at the end of August and or whatever. And well, at the end of August, my editor says, I can't publish. We can't publish 350,000 words. Can you cut 50,000 words? And I'm like, oh, and in one month, I cut 50,000 words. So I over, so I was able to go through and 
pull out anything that I didn't need. Well, who knows? Uh, then it was right, only right. then it was only three hundred thousand words. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, how do you keep track of everything in your books? Do you just have a magnificent mind that holds it all? Or do you use a spreadsheet? Do you use a bullet journal for the book? How do you, do you have a Bible? What do you do? I, um, a lot of stuff I do keep in my head, which is bad. So over time, I've learned to um, keep Bibles. Uh, so I have like for the, the Crossroads trilogy, which I wrote about 15 years ago, I have two big things that have everything down to the price of rice. Mm -hmm. um, so that when I'm writing along and, and I can just throw in the detail without having to pause, it's like she pulled out, you know, you know, the $3 for, they don't use dollars, mm -hmm. obviously. She pulled out $3, you know, for the rice she needed to buy. And then you keep going. So you can see, so that detail matters in the sense that they're going to eat rice, right? Mm -hmm. But and then it gives you that extra detail without having to describe anything or me yeah. having to think about it. Yeah. Um, and, so, and so I, I slowly, I won't, I won't get out any of those, but I have, like, I can see them around. So I, I build those so that I know, and partly it's for my own sake so that when I'm writing book two and I think, wait, what was the name of that thing? Then I can mm -hmm. go look for it. Mm -hmm. And if I don't have it in there, I can add it. And if I do have it in there, I've got it. And I can honestly, just that it. makes me feel so much better. I was worried you were going to say, it's all, it's all right up here. Got oh, it no. right up in the old oh, no. noggin. <laughs> no, be, no, no, I can't. I, I've, that, I'm, I always regret when I don't do a good yeah. enough notebook for a book. If it's going to be, if it's one book, that's fine. Then you never look at it again. Yeah. Um, then you don't worry. But if it's multiple books, you always want that as a fallback. Excellent. So. Kate, yeah. it has been such a joy talking to you. Where can we find you out there on the internet? I have a, uh, you can go to Kate Elliott, all one, two L's, two T's dot com, which will actually redirect you to my blog, which is called I make up worlds. I love that. Dot com, all one word. Um, but it doesn't have anything to do with makeup. It's just like that makeup. Yeah. I, they keep that would not have even crossed my makeup. mind when I saw yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not that. I'm not that person. <laughs> um, that's my website. I have a newsletter called I Make Up Worlds on Substack, which eventually I'm going to get moved to my WordPress site, but I've not, I don't have time for that right now. Um, I have a Patreon and I'm on Blue Sky and Threads and I am still on Twitter, although not very, I mean, it's soon to not be. And on Instagram as Kate Elliott SFF, like science fiction, fantasy, all one word. And that is my handle on all of those social media platforms. Perfect. Thank you so much for being here. This was absolutely wonderful. It's been a joy. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for having me. And um, I'm waiting. I'll be waiting now for that science fiction fantasy novel. I'm just saying. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm patient. I'm patient. 